Hi, very good morning. I'm Dr. Janak Patel, MD, general physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. The material, whatever I have gathered, is from different YouTubes, from Google, some of the books, etc. Today's lecture will be very, very useful to almost all students, fourth year, third year, in theory as well as oral exam. Also, it will be very useful in your everyday practice. We are going to discuss today regarding dyspnea. Nowadays, it is also called shortness of breath. In short, we call SOB. As routine, we will be discussing under all these headings. By definition, still, we always describe dyspnea as a subjective sensation of difficult or labored breathing or shortness of breath. This means difficult or painful. Pneumia means breath. Now, depending upon the individual person, person will describe either as I cannot get enough air, I cannot breathe deeply, I feel chest tightness or heaviness, I feel choking sensation. These are the different description given for the dyspnea word. There is also one of the way of describing dyspnea as abnormally uncomfortable awareness of breathing. Means person is uncomfortable, is aware of breathing and it is abnormal. A normal resting person is unaware of breathing. But a person who is aware of breathing will be in favor of dyspnea. Mild to moderate exertion, person starts becoming aware. But after a heavy exertion, unpleasant awareness will be there. But this is for a short period. As soon as it takes a rest, now again he will become unaware of breathing effort. There is an another way of describing a dyspnea is consciousness of necessity of Increase respiratory effort to supply the need of oxygen. And this is being described as a dyspnea index, which has to be less than 70%. That is breathing reserve divided by maximal voluntary ventilation. We don't want to go into all those details. But again, this is a better definition. Abnormally uncomfortable awareness of breathing. You can describe that as a dyspnea. There is something they call clinical and physiological. Clinical is subjective experience of breathing discomfort consisting of qualitatively distinct sensation that vary in intensity. Difficult words are utilized. In physiological, it is a stimulation of pulmonary and extrapulmonary afferent receptor and the transmission of the afferent information to cerebral cortex where the sensation is perceived as uncomfortable or unpleasant and that is dyspnea. A long, long definition. Again, we go back. Subjective sensation of difficult or labor breathing or shortness of breath or another way to describe is abnormally uncomfortable awareness of breathing. That is a simplified and best definition. We will be having a separate lecture on respiratory distress. It is a vague term where person is not breathing well and it includes accessory muscle of respiration working, tachypnea, gasping, panting or we call 
excessive sweating or we call prostration person is restless he is confused and there is sleepiness hypercarbia and this will be heading towards respiratory failure now there are certain things which will have similar clinical description but they are not dyspnea means dyspnea is not associated with if the person has got oxygen saturation of hemoglobin which may be affected total amount of oxygen attached to hemoglobin is also not concerned with dyspnea amount of oxygen in the solution in the blood that is pao2 so dyspnea does not mean anything regarding hemoglobin anything regarding amount of oxygen attached to hemoglobin anything about the solution oxygen concentration in the blood not the respiratory rate but it is a subjective sensation of a person making an effort for increasing the oxygen concentration and in that there are dilatation of nares or we call nasal flares cyanosis accessory muscle of respiration may be working there may be abnormal tachypnea or hyperapnea that is depth is increased or there may be abnormal rhythm indirectly hemoglobin concentration and oxygenation of hemoglobin does not mean dyspnea but dyspnea is described as a subjective sensation of difficulty in breathing or awareness of breathing there are different terms which are being utilized depending upon the etiology we call respiratory groups cardiovascular group neurogenic group hematological group hysterical because of toxic drugs and chemicals associated with certain groups like hyperpyrexia shock stage metabolic disorders etc and this particular group can be divided into acute and chronic but etiological wise we call cardiac etiology respiratory mix non cardiac non respiratory basically we divide into this group so this neurogenic hematological hysterical toxic and associated condition metabolic condition will come into non cardiac non respiratory so there is one term also dyspnea on exertion and dyspnea after eating that is called post prandial dyspnea these are some of the words will be explaining you further there are different ways of grading them one is modified bog scale visual analog scale modified medical research counseling scale oxygen cost diagram baseline dyspnea index designed dyspnea index etc these are all the different ways in which you can classify them but as far as a heart failure is concerned there is one classification by nyha classification we group them into class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 class 4 is very easy dyspnea at rest so there is severe limitation and discomfort with which the person is discomfortable even at any physical activity so dyspnea is present even at rest we also use the another word that is orthopnea while this is class 3 is marked limitation of physical activity person is comfortable at rest but less than ordinary activity will cause the symptom means with minimal exertion person will get dyspnea and even person will have dyspnea even while di- lying down and during night we use the word paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea so pnd is put into class 3 if there is a slight restriction of physical activity person is comfortable at rest 
and person can do ordinary physical activity and person starts becoming breathless then we put them into class 2 there is no limitation of physical activity or ordinary physical activity does not cause any symptom then we put them into class 1 this is one of the way of classifying but this is because of cardiovascular conditions or we call heart failure this does not include respiratory does not include other condition which will produce dyspnea like we call as a non cardiac non respiratory groups that is not included all this i have already discussed in a chapter you can go through in detail in vital signs respiratory that is respiration eupnea tachypnea bradypnea apnea hyperapnea these are all the things which are very frequently asked in your oral and very very commonly you will come across in your everyday practice eupnea means normal breathing tachypnea means increased heart increased respiratory rate bradypnea means decrease in the respiratory rate less than 8 per minute tachypnea means more than 24 per minute apnea means absence of respiratory effort hyperapnea means increase in rate increase in depth of respiration but the rate remains normal but if you get tachypnea plus hyperapnea then we call that as a kusmal's breathing and classical example of kusmal's breathing is diabetic ketoacidosis and other condition which can produce metabolic acidosis chain stroke breathing there is a gradual increase and decrease in the respiration with a regular period of apnea and that is chain stroke breathing classical in case of a raised intracranial pressure and brain stem injury bites breathing is a rapid respiratory effort with irregular pauses of apnea and that is again in case of a head injury and severe brain stem injury or almost we say that towards the end stage of herniation like we call as a tonsillar herniation in that case you will get that there is one another word very frequently utilized that is apneustic breathing where you get prolonged inspiratory phase with a short expiratory phase and there is tachypnea this is again a very very good sign in case of a brainstem lesion so these are some of the things which you should keep it in mind can be asked in your oral all this terminology whatever we have described tachypnea dyspnea on exertion orthopnea pnd etc do remember all those terms we have discussed this before these are also some of the things which will be dyspnea is shortness of breath can be acute or can be chronic tachypnea is more than 24 per minute bradypnea is less than 8 per minute apnea is absence of respiration or we call absence of respiratory effort pnd is sudden onset of breathlessness during night in a early left ventricular failure orthopnea is increase dyspnea on lying down person has to get up within few seconds to a minute and then he becomes little comfortable in orthopnic posture or a sitting posture that is orthopnea and according to nyha classification it will be put into grade 4 and pnd is in grade 3 there is one term called as a platypnea where person becomes breathless in sitting posture and is better on lying down posture one of the classical example of that is right to left shunt particularly or av shunt in a lung also you can get platypnea in a person with left atrial myxoma or also in a case of 
what we call is a ball wall thrombus. There is one another term called as tripopnea, where the person is breathless on one lateral decubitus position and he improves by turning to the other opposite side. So he feels better, say, in a right lateral position. He becomes more breathless when he turns to left lateral position. That is called tripopnea. This is again very characteristic in a person with a left atrial myxoma or a right atrial myxoma or in a left atrial thrombus, a big thrombus. We will have a separate one lecture on tripopnea and platypnea. Now, as far as the etiology is concerned, we commonly divide into four big groups, cardiac, pulmonary, cardiac plus pulmonary mix. Sometimes the person can have both elements together. And fourth group, we call it a non-cardiac, non-pulmonary, which will include hypoxic, metabolic, hematological, miscellaneous, physical deconditioning, and psychogenic. All these groups will be included in non-cardiac, non-pulmonary. Some of the examples in respiratory groups, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, will have a damage at the level of what we call is a gas exchange. While COPD, asthma, a gross skeletal deformity like kyphoscoliosis will be in a pump failure. And this will be included in restrictive lung disease as well as obstructive lung disease. This will be obstructive lung disease. This will be restrictive lung disease. While there will be some disease which will be having effect at the respiratory center level like metabolic acidosis, hypercarbia, that is excessive PCO2. During pregnancy also, you can have effect on respiratory center. In cardiovascular center, you can divide them according to the pathophysiology, like low output, classical example in congestive heart failure, acute MI, severe constrictive pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, etc. will come in this group. With normal output, diastolic dysfunction, obesity, decondensing and high output like anemia, hypothyroidism, AV shunt, IV fluid overload, all those groups. Putting together in pulmonary group COPD, the most common conditions, COPD, bronchial asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, massive pleural effusion, severe chest deformity like kyphoscoliosis, pulmonary hypertension, ARDS, SARS, acute upper airway obstruction, etc. Even at present, we come across what we call as a COVID-19. In cardiac group, acute coronary syndrome, acute MI, congestive heart failure, which will include LVF, as well as right ventricular failure, pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, tachyarrhythmias, particularly ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, pericarditis, usually not pericarditis, but pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, and valvular heart disease, particularly a regurgitation rather than stenosis will land up with congestive cardiac failure and left ventricular failure early. While non-cardiac, non-respiratory group, anemia, methemoglobinemia, sulfhemoglobinemia, anxiety, huge ascites, pregnancy, diabetic ketoacidosis, stroke, intracranial pressure elevation, iantrogenic, drug-induced, high altitude, we can even put HEP, high altitude, pulmonary edema. Now, there is one thing which I would like to mention at this stage. Many conditions of this will also cause hypoxia, like cardiovascular, respiratory, anemia, blood, and high altitude. By and large, severe hypoxia will be associated with cyanosis. But in case of anemia, you may not have cyanosis. 
because there is a lack of hemoglobin and for cyanosis you require 5 gram percentage of reduced hemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin circulating in the blood. So that will not produce cyanosis while well, cardiovascular respiratory high altitude will produce cyanosis. But anemia then we call carboxyhemoglobin which will also produce hypoxia and will also produce dyspnea but will not have cyanosis because the blood carboxyhemoglobin is cherry red color blood. While in case of methemoglobinemia and sulfhemoglobinemia, person will have dyspnea but may not show you cyanosis. You will see cyanosis if there is good amount of methemoglobin or sulfhemoglobin present in blood. If person is having a chronic hypoxia, person will develop cyanosis as well as clubbing. So these are some of the clinical clue. Same thing is given here in cardiovascular, it is described into myocardial, pericardial condition and arrhythmias. Pulmonary that is airway, vasculature, pleura, alveoli, parenchyma. You can divide depending upon whatever. It is better to remember some of the common causes because it will be good for your oral as well as for your theory exams. As far as chest wall is concerned, kyphosis, obesity, flyal chest, neuromuscular condition, myasthenia gravis, gulen barre, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, blood, anemia, then other condition like metabolic acidosis, like diabetic ketoacidosis, thyrotoxicosis, anxiety, and also don't forget psychogenic and physical deconditioning. These are the common respiratory conditions, COPD, asthma, restrictive lung disease, interstitial lung disease, pneumonia, pneumothorax, etc. Among cardiovascular congestive heart failure, acute coronary syndrome, acute MI, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, Pericarditis does not come, but pericardial effusion, constrictive pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, LV dysfunction, and valvular dysfunction, which will finally end up with, we call as a congestive heart failure. Among mix, classical example is corpomonal, may be acute or chronic. Another is deconditioning, then chronic pulmonary embolization, and massive pleural effusion. Non-cardiac, non-pulmonary, metabolic acidosis, classical example, diabetic ketoacidosis, anxiety, chest trauma, chemical fumes, psychogenic, panic disorders, hyperventilations, and neuromuscular junction disorders like myasthenia gravis, botulism, etc. So this is again divided traumatic group, non-traumatic group. This will be traumatic group where you will have airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, flyal chest, cardiac tamponade, or you have got a damage to aortic rupture, diaphragmatic rupture, esophageal disruption, pulmonary contusion, tracheobronchial damage, etc. In neonates, respiratory condition, non-respiratory condition, in children, respiratory, non-respiratory, at your leisure time, you can go through. This is in adult, acute and chronic, respiratory, non-respiratory groups. In chronic, respiratory, non-respiratory groups. Yes, useful in your clinical practice. But for theory, you can put some of the common conditions. And in oral also, mention some of the common condition. Don't try to mention rare conditions. At your leisure time, you can go through. This is in children. This is in adult. This is acute, sudden onset, rapid onset. This is few minutes. This is hours. This is days and weeks. This is gradual. This is rapid. This is absolutely sudden. So this will be emergency. This will be also emergency. Here. It is over a period of days, you can get a good history, you can examine, 
you can investigate and treat them so by and large remember this 6p very very important in acute dyspnea that is acute pulmonary edema pneumothorax pulmonary embolism pneumonia airway obstruction so foreign body pulmonary embolism pneumonia pump failure that is cardiovascular condition pneumothorax and acute attack of bronchial asthma so these are the some of the example as far as chronic is concerned where it is more than one month some people includes that more than 3 months should be included in chronic some of the person is mentioning chronic as more than one month where in respiratory group cardiovascular group and miscellaneous group these are the common condition in your everyday practice like congestive heart failure respiratory disease like copd acute exacerbation of copd acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma anxiety obesity pleural effusion etc so if you take in a respiratory pleural effusion copd bronchial asthma fungal pneumonia mycobacterial tube that is tuberculosis interstitial lung disease pulmonary hypertension av malformation that will be in a respiratory group out of this copd bronchial asthma comes topmost on the list interstitial lung disease will be another condition and pulmonary hypertension these are the common groups which you will come across as far as cardiovascular con condition is concerned heart failure we always use the word chronic congestive heart failure constrictive pericarditis valvular heart disease tachybrady arrhythmias and what we call as a coronary artery disease particularly angina equivalent syndrome as far as non cardiac non respiratory group is concerned anemia kyphoscoliosis renal failure obesity decondensing neuromuscular disorders like myasthenia gravis those groups so life threatening condition we already mentioned this will be all life threatening condition should be diagnosed as early as possible and should be treated myocardial infarction vt status asthmaticus pulmonary embolism tension pneumothorax anaphylactic shock airway obstruction diabetic ketoacidosis gbs carbon monoxide poisoning salicylate poisoning pulmonary embolism florid pulmonary edema hypercapnic respiratory failure severe upper airway obstruction ards still there may be some may be remaining now if you go through this particular group almost 85% of the people will be because of congestive heart failure and we call coronary artery disease or acute coronary syndromes that will be as far as cardiac group is concerned among respiratory group asthma copd interstitial lung disease pneumonia comes topmost on the list while psychogenic disorders is less 30% of the time it is related to the multiple groups that is maybe cardiac respiratory together or maybe cardiac with non cardiac non respiratory groups etc permutation combination you can divide according to the pathophysiology like hypoxia hypercapnia acidosis poor oxygen delivery and miscellaneous i am not going into detail at your leisure time you can go through this condition will result into hypoxic condition here there will be little hypoventilation and that will produce excess of carbon dioxide in blood producing hypercapnia here there will be hypercapnia with metabolic acidosis or independent metabolic acidosis can be there in the lactic acid acidosis like peripheral shock even ketoacidosis in case of diabetic ketoacidosis and lactic acidosis can occur in a even in a case of a severe congestive heart failure 
poor oxygen delivery can be there classical example will be anemia or low output heart failure massive pulmonary embolism cardiac tamponade tension pneumothorax where will be there will be less amount of hypoxia but oxygen delivery will be poor also you can put here poor oxygen delivery in case of a meth hemoglobinemia sulf hemoglobinemia and carboxy hemoglobin and this will be miscellaneous groups where there multiple etiological factor may be working so hypoxia acidosis or hypercarbia decrease comp compliance or airway resistance hypoxia will stimulate carotid body ph and co2 will stimulate the medullary chemoreceptors decrease compliance will stimulate the mikeno receptors in lung as well as muscles that is we call as a respiratory muscles and airway resistance will stimulate the j receptor which are present in the lung all this will stimulate and give rise to what we call as a discomfort and that we call as a dyspnea so this is secondary due to stimulation of chemo receptor in acidosis and hypercarbia mikeno receptor in case of a decrease compliance making a more effort for respiration and metabolo receptor which will be stimulated in case of a carotid body medullary receptors as well as because of increased depth of respiration you will have j receptors which will be stretched and that will produce feeling of discomfort if you want to go into detail this are further in detail where are the mikeno receptors where are the j receptors where are the stretch receptors c fibers will be stimulated then chemo receptor will be stimulated all those is given in detail at your leisure time you can go through i'll go through this one slide this is a good slide that is whenever there is a excess work by the diaphragm mikeno receptors of diaphragm and chest wall muscles will be stimulated they will sense an effort and that will give rise to dyspnea as well as motor cortex will be stimulated by other factors which will also make a sense of increase effort and it will increase your respiratory movements that is respiratory muscles that is we call hyperapnea and tachypnea both will stimulate the mikeno receptors bronchoconstriction will give rise to lung irritation and that will be stretching of the j receptors increased lung volume will also stimulate the j receptors interstitial pressure will be elevated will stimulate the c fibers this j receptor that is the lung receptors when they are stimulated person will feel chest tightness that is a part of dyspnea hypoxia will stimulate chemo receptor co2 and h ions will also stimulate the chemo receptor there are two receptors that is central and peripheral peripheral receptor will be stimulated by h ion and pco2 while central receptor will be stimulated by hypoxia hypercarbia and acidosis while sensory receptors will be stimulated by upper airway and face which will also produce what we call as a cold air can stimulate those receptors sensory receptors and person will have air hunger vagus now which is stimulated which will be inhibiting this and by inhibiting you will have air hunger the person will feel dyspnea there will be decondensing of the muscle wasting also will stimulate dyspnea a person who has got a social isolation and depression or psychogenic groups they will also have decreased effort and person will feel dyspnea even emotions will stimulate dyspnea and dyspnea will also stimulate the emotion which will have involuntary effort etc this is all the 
mechanism is being explained in dyspnea. So there are chemoreceptors which are present in carotid body and medulla. There are mechanoreceptors which are present in tracheobronchial tree as well as in a, what we call as a muscles. There are J receptors which are present in the interstitial lung tissue. So this is again a similar diagram where you get a central stimulation. Those are chemoreceptors which will be stimulated by pH while carotid body receptor will be stimulated by oxygen that is hypoxia and hypercarbia. You will have a receptors which are present in the lung which we call as a J receptors. There will be mechanoreceptors which will be present in the skeletal muscle, diaphragm, etc. So at your leisure time you can go through these are all the different diagrams showing you where the receptors are present and how it stimulates. These are all the different diagrams. At your leisure time you can go through. So there are J receptors, there are stretch receptors, there are chemoreceptors and there are what we call as a mechanoreceptors. By and large, the person will describe as unsatisfied inspiration, chest tightness, feeling of breathless, cannot get enough air, there is a hunger for air, incomplete expiration, my chest feels tight, I cannot take deep breath, I feel like I am having pillow over my mouth, I am smoothering. These are all the different descriptions. So, cannot get enough air, smoothering, tightness, tiredness, choking sensation, air does not go to all way down. These are all the different ways of description. In respiratory groups, along with dyspnea, there will be cough with expectoration. You will have wheezing. By and large, it is not related to exertion. Means dyspnea will not become worse by exertion. Fever good number of time you will come across pleuritic chest pain loss of weight particularly in tuberculosis malignancy chronic respiratory disease like bronchiectasis lung abscess chronic bronchitis in those group you will have a loss of weight it is gradually progressive over many years and you give oxygen bronchodilator person will give a positive response and person will feel better Particularly in case of a bronchial asthma, you will have a seasonal variation. Good number of time, it is described as a dyspnea, as angina equivalent. Dry cough may be there, described as a dyspnea equivalent. Bronchospasm can have an occult cardiac etiology. Recent disease or dramatic disease can mimic like heart failure. So, you should keep this thing in mind. While in cardiac, the classical symptoms which they will come to you with will be PND or thopnea. Very frequently, person will have a symptoms pertaining to heart disease like chest pain. We call ischemic chest pain. Person will have a history of hypertension, prior history of infarct. Person can have cough with blood stained frothy sputum or pink frothy sputum. Good number of time there will be rapidly deterioration and person will show a very good response to diuretic and digoxin. As far as the cardiac dyspnea is concerned, very frequently it is on exertion and you can grade them into grade 1 to grade 4. Continuous dyspnea at rest will be less likely to be non-cardiac group. So you must keep it in mind that if a person is continuously dyspnea even at rest also could be non-cardiac groups. PND will have a separate lecture on that and orthopnea also will have a separate lecture. 
Usually in cardiac, you will have a JVP elevated. This is external jugular vein. You will have a JVP elevated. You will have a bilateral edema, pitting edema. You will have cyanosis, quite common. So while going through the history, onset, duration, how it has progressed, severity, variability, aggravating factor, relieving factor, any relation to rest or on exertion, how much exertion, associated symptoms like cough, sputum, orthopnea, PND, chest pain, leg cramps, edema, cyanosis, fever, oliguria, etc. should be asked for. So they put onset, duration, aggravating factor, relieving factor and associated symptoms. All those we have mentioned here. And also from onset and duration you can differentiate into acute, chronic and again in acute, sudden onset, rapid onset. You can differentiate that. And always try to find out associated symptoms by getting a good history. So after getting a good history and examination, you should be sure that it is dyspnea or not. And if it is dyspnea, whether it is cardiac, pulmonary or mix we call cardiopulmonary or non-cardiac, non-pulmonary. At least we should be able to subclassify them into those groups. So this is good history. Physical examination will include vital data. Then respiratory cardiovascular system examination followed by CNS examination and then laboratory parameters. If you suspect respiratory chest x-ray PFT is absolutely of importance and then you can go for further radiological like HRCT, CT scan, MRI. While in case of a cardiac ECG, x-ray chest, ECO comes topmost on the list followed by pro BNP and terminal pro BNP and then you can go for other laboratory parameter like CBC, renal function test, liver function test, you can go for troponin, enzymes etc. So depending upon what you are suspecting clinically you can go for. We have already mentioned some of these things, acute dyspnea, which is absolutely sudden, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, acute MI, acute LVF, foreign body, some of the common everyday practice. Over hours and days, pneumonia, acute exacerbation of COPD. Also, non-cardiac, non-respiratory, do keep it in mind, renal failure, diabetic ketoacidosis or salicylate poisoning, alcohol intoxication, hyperventilation syndromes. Over 1 to 2 hours, status asthmaticus, acute left ventricular failure, which may be because of acute MI, acute MR, acute AR, acute TR. These are some of the examples. Chronic dyspnea, usually it is very, very useful and very easy. Among airway, COPD, bronchial asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. Among parenchymal disease, interstitial lung disease. Among pleura, mainly pleural fibrosis. And among pulmonary vasculature, veno-occlusive disease, AV malformations. But out of this, this comes topmost on the list. That is COPD, bronchial asthma, chronic bronchitis and interstitial lung disease. Those group will come topmost on the list. In a chronic dyspnea, if it is with wheeze, more in favor of asthma, COPD. In COPD, sputum and history of smoking is very, very important. And excessive sputum, early morning, copious sputum, bronchiectasis. If there is no wheeze, think in terms of pneumoconiosis if there is an occupational history available. And if there is lot of crackles and there is clubbing, interstitial lung disease. And if there is chest pain, pleural drop, hemoptysis, think in terms of pulmonary embolism. Nocturnal dyspnea, good number of time you will come across. Classical example, in case of a congestive heart failure, particularly a early left ventricular failure. 
also in case of copd bronchial asthma sleep apnea post nasal drip and nocturnal aspiration of grd nocturnal aspiration in grd this will be some of the common groups that is grd sleep apnea syndromes post nasal drip and acute left ventricular arrest uh, sorry not acute but early left ventricular failure and also you will come across in case of a bronchial asthma there is one condition which is being mentioned in the book we call post prandial dyspnea which is after meal more common with grd and in grd you get aspiration or some time to the food allergy so that will be post prandial dyspnea if dyspnea is acute and there is stridor very frequent it is because of foreign body or there may be a tumor compressing on a trachea or there may be what we call as a inspiratory stridor in case of a whooping cough laryngeal carcinoma laryngeal edema angioneurotic edema anaphylactic shock etc chest pain with acute dyspnea in case of an acute pulmonary embolism mi acute dissection cardiac tamponade massive pericardial effusion and if the person is having pleuritic chest pain pulmonary embolism pleural effusion pneumonia etc some of the example if there is an excessive sputum bronchiectasis chronic bronchitis usually in an asthma and if person is having acute exacerbation he might have a yellowish green sputum hemoptysis more common in pulmonary embolism vasculitis more common occasionally in case of an acute exacerbation of copd or bronchial asthma a person will have a bulbar symptom that is cns finding in case of myasthenia gravis gbs motor neuron disease like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis etc so wheezing fever cough edema tachypnea chest pain in which condition you will get almost we have mentioned before same thing is mentioned good for your oral exam and also it will be very helpful when you go for your private practice at your leisure time you can go through this is a difference between three groups that is pneumonia congestive heart failure and pulmonary embolism which symptoms are more common in which group at your leisure time you can go through otherwise this will be a very long topic so i am keeping this slide you can go through at your leisure time there is one very interesting test which you can do we call 6 minute walk test so how the breathlessness were you at the end of the 6 minute is judged so if a person becomes breathless extreme breathlessness then it suggest so 6 minute walk a person is having a serious or extreme breathlessness by walking 150 meter only or less than 150 meter it is a serious cardiac dysfunction if he is able to walk in 6 minute and there is a moderate cardiac dysfunction if he is able to walk 150 meter to 425 meter and if he can walk almost 400 to 500 meters there is a very very mild cardiac dysfunction so this gives you a rough idea and after walking for a 6 minutes any person is not breathless at all less likely to have a cardiac dysfunction there are some red flag sign if a dyspnea is associated with hypotension if there is an extreme tachypnea like respiratory rate is more than 40 per minute there is alter mental status which is very frequently because of hypercarbia person is heading towards respiratory failure if there is a severe hypoxia if there is a severe cyanosis person is having stridor and person is making a breathing effort without any improvement in oxygen concentration there is a marked tracheal deviation with unilateral breath sound which is a characteristic in case of a massive collapse maybe because of foreign body or maybe because of massive tension pneumothorax or there is a cardiac arrhythmias associated with dyspnea 
do keep it in mind and that all those things we put together a good history good physical examination a good general examination vital data chest examination cardiovascular system examination etc will give you an idea regarding whether it is cardiovascular respiratory mix or what we call is non cardiac non respiratory and then depending upon that you can go for investigations we have already mentioned before these are the good charts we call algorithms at your leisure time you can go through these are all the charts standard charts this is what you will come across if there is a normal x ray chest airway disease early fibrosis pulmonary embolism neuromuscular disorders anemia if you suspect that you go for spirometry pft hrct vq scan ct angiography neuromuscular testing if there is on x ray abnormal lung fields and there is a thicken pleura or pleural effusion then you can go for pleural aspiration or we call pleurosynthesis biopsy ct with biopsy or video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and if on a x ray there is a tumor or there is a collapse or there is a diffuse infiltrative lung disease or there is a bullous disease you can go for ct scan bronchoscopy transbronchial biopsy etc if there is a lymphadenopathy then also you can go for because this will be you will have to rule out malignancy if there is an abnormal lymphadenopathy seen in a mediastinum or if there is a large pulmonary vessels you can go for ct angio and echo if there is a cardiomegaly then you suspect left ventricular failure or pericardial effusion you go for echo and you can go for angiography you want to rule out coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease this is again a chart flow charts it is divided into acute and chronic what you do in chronic what you do in acute at your leisure time grow to we have already discussed some of those things before same thing here what are the findings focal crackles diffuse crackles bilateral findings this will be all in respiratory system and some of those will be cardiogenic non cardiogenic so depending upon the finding you will be going through so at your leisure time you can go through this is again a very good because dyspnea is a very very long chapter at your leisure time if you don't understand if you have got any difficulty you can contact me i'll try to make it simplified this is a person has got low oxygen saturation normal x ray normal lung examination what will you will you do chronic cough what you will do chronic cough with weight loss and fever particularly in india tuberculosis will come topmost on the list what you will do so these are all different conditions which are being taken in acute condition chronic conditions then if there is a local findings if there is a diffuse finding if there is a bilateral decrease in the breath sounds what what procedures you will follow so those are all the things which are chronic cough hypoxia with normal lung examination chronic cough with weight loss then loud p2 symptom signs of heart failure if person has got orthopnea pnd what will you do it is clear cut this will be cardiovascular groups then if person has got palpitation if person has got severe anemia exertional chest pain if person is having severe kyphoscoliosis if person is having muscle weakness almost all category has been covered up at your leisure time you can go through all you can have a pause and you can go through these are all flow charts means any person who comes to you with a dyspnea how you can go through i'm having a slide for some period of time you can have a screenshot and go initial evaluation is always history followed by a good examination and then laboratory parameters 
among laboratory parameter in respiratory system we have already mentioned x ray chest very very helpful then you can go for hrct ct or ct angio pulmonary angio as far as the cardiovascular group is concerned bnp and terminal pro bnp ecg eco in respiratory pft very very important and then you can go for abg lactate levels acetone level procalcitonin chemistry panel like renal function liver function test electrolytes d dimer troponin etc even you can to rule out thyrotoxicosis t3040 acid so standard chest x ray ecg and terminal bnp d dimer eco very very helpful ultrasounds pulmonary embolism you should rule out chest x ray if there is a cardiomegaly then you can go for cardiac work up if there is respiratory finding you can for, go for a respiratory work up biopsy as far as a pulmonary very commonly not done it may be done in a case to rule out what we call as a interstitial lung disease group not commonly advised for spirometry is one of the common investigation to rule out obstructive restrictive lung disease even in presence of a cardiovascular groups this is a very good slide showing you these are all the parameter what we have done and among those what are the findings so if there is a normal oxygen saturation normal lung examination normal x ray chest and you have gone for all this investigation if ct is abnormal ct angio it will be more for pulmonary embolism ecg will be very useful in a ischemic heart disease to rule out acute coronary syndromes hemoglobin will be very helpful to rule out severe anemia you can go for work up then metabolic abg will be helpful to find out metabolic acidosis and you can rule out with the lactic acidosis or it is diabetic ketoacidosis maybe salicylate poisoning alcohol intoxication etc and if there is what we call as a respiratory acidosis you can go for a certain work up if everything is ruled out all these things are normal all these things are normal then you can go for what we call as a psychogenic that is anxiety and if there is pulses paradoxes you can go for pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade as far as management is concerned always we say that identify the etiology and treat the underlying condition but till you make the diagnosis because of hypoxia supplement the oxygen we call as circulation airway and breathing cap then you can go for drugs pulmonary rehabilitation and non pharmacological approach so certain conditions diagnose early there are some treatment pneumothorax what we call as a chest tube thoracostomy or you can put a needle also and drain out if there is a foreign body removal of foreign body by a fiber optic bronchoscope in a status asthmaticus bronchodilator steroids and if there is an acute exacerbation leading to status asthmaticus antibiotics in anaphylaxis adrenaline and stop precipitating factor or avoid precipitating factors depending upon the etiology there are some things if there is a hypoxia oxygen heart failure diuretics pneumothorax chest tubes pulmonary embolism anticoagulants and thrombolytic therapy status asthmaticus bronchodilator steroids copd bronchodilator antibiotic and steroids foreign body bronchoscopic and removal of foreign body pneumonia antibiotics ards you will require an artificial uh, or we call invasive supports 
hemothorax pleural drainage or we call pleurocentesis or pleural drainage so immediate management not abc but cab cap and then get the vital signs try to find out what is producing serious side effects like hypoxia hypercapnia hypotension etc and try to find out that and treat accordingly so treatment of hypotension some of the things which will be very very important altered level of consciousness hypoxia arrhythmias strider severe tachypnea severe tachypnea absence of breath sounds accessory muscle of respiration working cyanosis all this will be giving you a idea that this is emergency and depending upon that depending upon the etiology you will manage so initial management of acute distress by oxygen and try to come to the nearmost diagnosis you will have to give bronchodilators in case of asthma copd and in case of acute pulmonary edema diuretics in case of tension pneumothorax needle thoracocentesis so this will be the thing you call an emergency check for airway pulse breathing a person has develop a cardiac arrest cpr loosen the clothes help the person to use the prescribed medicines monitor the breathings and pulse open wound should be treated as early as possible bandage and suction of the wound with plastic wrap sealing etc means this is in a traumatic injury these are the flow charts as far as the treatment in a respiratory distress is concerned this is again same mention in little more detail at your leisure time you can go through traumatic what you do in a anaphylaxis what you do in a pneumonia then after getting an ecg pulmonary embolism acute exacerbation of copd or acute exacerbation of asthma those groups by and large the common complication is because of hypoxia which can be acute or chronic we have done in detail in a chapter of hypoxia so you can go through those you can have a damage because of the hyperbaric oxygen when you give that for a longer therapy and you can have a complication secondary due to the basic etiology say like traumatic injury you can have a complication because of trauma or you can have a complication because of say acute mi or you can have a complication say because of a ards etc so very long chapter i have tried to cover up most important part which will be very helpful to you in your theory as well as oral exam as well as in your everyday practice so at the end of this lecture i thank you all for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate that you have spent some of the time with me i feel definitely that this lecture will be very helpful to you in your oral exam theory as well as in your everyday practice if you like this lecture please press button like subscribe you can press bell icon so you can message whenever i upload the video and if you like this lecture and if you feel your friends will be benefited you can share with your friends so see you in next lecture